Butter hardness. What do we know? What do we not know? And what do we need to know? There's been a lot of discussion in recent days about the issue of butter hardness and whether the feeding of palm fat to dairy cows is contributing to changes. This is the second of two discussions from Food Focus and Dairy at Guelph to try to bring some perspective to the questions and to highlight gaps in our knowledge. My name is Mike von Masso. Helping me in shedding some light on this issue today are three highly qualified individuals. Andrew Campbell is a dairy farmer and advocate for sharing the story of agriculture with Canadians and consumers around the world. Dr. Mike Steele is an associate professor in dairy nutrition at the U of G and an NSERC industrial research chair in dairy cattle nutrition. Dr. Stephen LeBlanc is a veterinarian and professor in the Ontario Veterinary College who specializes in dairy cow health. I expect you'll find the discussion that follows very informative. Well, gentlemen, thanks for taking the time. I'm excited to have this conversation uh, just to uh, help us understand a little better some of the questions, myths, truths, what we know, what we don't know, what we should know uh, about uh, about this issue relative to butter and the use of palm oil and dairy. So let's start with probably the, let's start at the beginning where, where, where this all started. And, and the question is, is butter changing? Uh, my perception is that uh, if, if I was, a, not as a scientist, as a small sample, the butter in my house hasn't changed. But I would say that there are a lot of people who, who believe that their butter has changed. What is the reality? Yeah, I'll start with that. I, I don't think we actually know uh, if butter has changed. And I think it warrants more investigation until we do the experiments, which can be easily done within a week to determine this. I, I don't think that we should really say that much. But to my knowledge, I, I don't think the quality of butter has changed. There's no evidence of that, but we can figure that out. I just know my relationship with butter has changed since COVID uh, due to all the baking I've been doing. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and frankly, uh, I'm in exactly the same boat, Mike, is uh, my relationship with butter has changed. Uh, and I think Canadians' relationship with butter has changed not only in the last 12 months, but in the last... 10 years as, as, you know, I used to joke that we used to pull our curtains if we ate butter and now you know, butter is cool again. So, uh, so I think we need to acknowledge that some people feel that it has changed. We need to understand why or what, uh, and how, uh, and if, uh, to understand why that might've changed and to say, is there anything we can do about it? So we've seen come to the fore a theory that, or a claim that it's because of the feeding of palm fat to dairy cows. So let's start there and say, maybe I'll start with you, Andrew. Do dairy farmers feed palm oil to cows? So certainly, and and I mean, from my perspective is obviously the one I'll use as well as the perspective because I've had lots of conversations with lots of other dairy farmers and nutritionists over the last couple of weeks. Um, and, and the answer can't be a short one because it's sometimes maybe uh, yeah. is basically where we're at. Uh, you know, for, for us in our case, um, the reason we would feed it and we have fed it in the past um, is through those summer months. Um, because in the summer months, you know, cows just aren't real thrilled with 40 degree weather that we get. Um, and, you know, based on how they go into the summer, we have to make that call to say, do they need that bit of an energy boost um, in order to support their overall well-being and their overall nutrition? So depending on what our, um, you know, health is like going into the summer, depending on what our, the feeds we're giving, um, you know, going into the summer, depending on a whole lot of things, then yeah, we might feed it. For us, you know, we didn't feed it last summer. It was the summer before was the last time we fed it. It was probably for six to eight weeks and then we pulled it out. And that seems to be the case for a lot of the farmers that I've talked to is that, you know, we feed it when we need to, but it's not the cheapest thing in the world. We'd really rather not. It's just a case to help those cows get through. Mike, Mike, can I turn to you then and say, wh why? Like, what does it do? Well, 
I think Andrew's point about feeding in summer months, uh, from a digestion standpoint, uh, there's less heat being released through the digestion of fats. So in the summer months, it does make sense scientifically to feed to feed fat to your cow, and it's been shown that palm fats uh, can fit really nicely into doing this. But also, um, some farmers are using them throughout the year and strategically in early lactation when cows undergo a negative energy balance. And it's really just to boost the energy density of that diet to make sure that the cow's still very healthy and not losing excessive condition. So if they lose a lot of weight in early lactation, that's a really negative thing when it comes to animal health. So it's used strategically to avoid that as well, uh, predominantly in early lactation. And I think now that we're moving more into precision management, not just feeding whole entire groups, all the same ingredients, we're feeding these, these specific ingredients um, to specific cows at specific time points, I think uh, you'll probably see it being used a lot more specifically in the dairy industry in the future. So, so and, and, and that gets to the, the, the individual health and energy needs of cows, right? Not, oh, this one, this, it is, it is saying this cow is early in lactation. She is pumping out a lot of milk. She's not eating as much, particularly in the first few days. And, and, and this allows us to, to, to make sure she gets the energy she needs. That's what you mean by this sort of precision. Yes. And we're so good at it in the dairy industry. We're so precise the way that we feed dairy cows. And, and this is just another example of how we strategically use some of these uh, specific products in the dairy rations that we balance. So one question I've had a lot, and Andrew, I expect I've had maybe not quite as many, but almost as many discussions over the last couple of weeks to, to, to learn and understand more. One of the questions I get from people who don't have a good understanding of, of what happens on a dairy farm is, are, are, are you talking that, that, you know, we have these tra troughs of oil that these cows are like, how much are we feeding? Well, again, that's another one of those very dependent things. Certainly it's not troughs, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, certainly it's not loads. Um, you know, it's, I, I remember, you know, from a couple of summers ago, um, you know, I, I have a, you know, great big mixer that hooks on the tractor. I fill it with all my ingredients. Um, and then because it's such a small amount, I would carry my bucket up to the top of the mixer and dump my, you know, handheld bucket into it. And when you mix it in, it, you know, it, ours was coming in, you know, a very small white, um, you know, kind of pearl like pellet almost, um, you know, you, you couldn't find that um, in the mix because it is such a small amount. But because it is, you know, as Mike was talking about that really, you know, energy dense product, we don't need a whole lot of it. We just need that little bit to give them the boost. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, sorry, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, and typically it's 1% of the diet that palm oil is actually being added. So, um, you know, there's a cost factor that goes into this. You don't want to feed large amounts. Um, it, it becomes quite cost prohibitive for the farmer. If you go over 500 grams a day, you, you rarely see any values close to that. It, it's usually around 200 grams a day, which is in a lot of cases less than 1% of what they're actually consuming. Yeah. Okay, so 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 it's a, it's it's like me eating a vitamin C pill or something in the morning. It's it, it, it probably even smaller than that. It's one element of my mic, uh, of my multivitamin. How long, you know, one of the things that, that, that we're hearing is all of a sudden this has happened and this has been sort of the cause of the change. Has this been, St Stephen, have they been, been, have we been feeding palm oil or palm supplements i think it's a, the, 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 there's a distinction there for is it is it a relatively new innovation we heard andrew talk about a couple of years but no it, it's not really new at all um it, it's been quite widespread for decades um on and off as as uh, both mike and andrew have have alluded to it's uh it's kind of a tactical thing that would come in and out of different farms rations at different times um, for the heat stress and for the early lactation support, but it, it's absolutely not new. Um, nor is are, are the palm-based uh, supplements the only ones. There there are other uh, fat supplements uh, available on on the market, but uh, 
Um, this has been uh, part of the toolkit for dairy farmers and nutritionists for at least 20 years and, and probably at a lower level uh, as much as, as 40 years. So we certainly have uh, acquired quite a lot of experience with this and, uh, and, and data to support that it's, um, uh, it, it's effective, but, but has to be watched carefully for the economic return insofar as that angle is concerned. Um, uh, but it's also at those very low levels, uh, very safe and very strategic for the cows. One one question, uh, and and uh, I didn't talk to you about this one before, Stephen. But but a question that I got the other day is, uh, is this bad for cows? Uh, no, um, I really don't think we have any any evidence to to that effect. In, in fact. Um, uh, again, as we've alluded to here, it's from the cow's perspective, it, it's really a nutritional support. Uh, like all mammals, uh, cows go into an energy deficit when they're in early lactation. And so this is just one tool in the toolkit that we have to provide them some nutritional support. Um, again, an energy deficit by definition means some weight loss. So we're, we're um, helping to minimize the weight loss, which has knock on benefits to the cow in terms of her metabolic health, in terms of her fertility down the track, in terms of uh, keeping her risk of uh, disease or lameness lower than it would otherwise be if, if she were to go into a uh, a more severe energy deficit, um, and again, in in the in the heat stress example in the summer, uh, again, it's a way to get uh, the groceries, the nutrients to cows at a time uh, when they just may not be feeling like having uh, that extra mouthful of feed that they that they might really need to meet their nutritional requirements. Uh, it's we can make each each mouthful just a little more energy dense. Um, and so for all of those reasons, uh, no, if, if anything, it's, it's probably a support for, for cow's health. Yeah, that's, that, that, that was my perception. I just wanted to, to be sure, cause I'm getting that question when I, when I talk to friends and neighbors uh, about this. So the next, the next question that I got, uh, and, and I think this is, this is another common misperception. Uh, there is not actually palm oil in our butter is there We're, it's not like the processors are adding palm oil butter is still made from butter fat we're feeding some palm fat to these cows for energy balance there is however uh, some palmitic acid in butter fat it is one of the fatty acids that's that is in butter fat and it's unfortunate that it has the same name as palm fat, uh, because that's in there naturally, whether we're feeding them palmitic acid or not. And in fact, it's in human milk as well. Is that is that not the case? Uh, absolutely. So 30% of the fat that the cow synthesizes in the mammary gland and produces, uh, that goes to produce the butter is palmitic acid, C16. So, so that is definitely something that the cow just naturally produces. And so it's not in there because it's in the feed there may be a slightly depending on feeding rates and you talked about that being variable mike depending on feeding rates there may or may not be a small impact on how much palmitic acid is in the cow's butter fat but the fact that there is palmitic acid in the cow's fat has nothing to do with having fed them that right uh, some of the palmitic acid can be synthesized by the mammary gland. Some of it can be uh, absorbed through the mammary gland. And the, I think a key point is palmitic acid C16 is in many different uh, feed ingredients. We're just talking about one with palm oil. There, there's hundreds of different ingredients that we feed the dairy cow that has palmitic acid in it, which could potentially make its way into milk fat. But a lot of it is produced, uh, what we would call de novo synthesis in the mammary gland. Okay, perfect. So that uh, exactly what I was hoping I'd accomplish today. I'm learning some things. So <laughs> let's take a step back then and say, uh, if there are changes in butter, which, as we said earlier, we're not sure of yet, 
but is worth finding out. I don't want to. I don't want to diminish the people's perceptions that it that it might be. Uh, do we know that it would come from feeding palm fat? No. <laughs> Again, you know, and, and I think that's a recurring theme here. But 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 to to, to be serious, yeah, that there's you know there's a lot here that you know questions have been raised and. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's tough to be patient and, and say, well, okay, we have a question, uh, you know, maybe an important question, but w- we, we don't have enough evidence to say whether that, that is or, or isn't the case. Um, that being said, in, in this case, based on the, albeit incomplete information that, you know, that we do have, um, my take of the evidence that I've been digging into over the last few weeks, like lots of people have, uh, is that it's it's actually quite improbable that feeding uh, palm-based fats or indeed other vegetable fats in a cow's diet at the levels at which we feed them, sometimes to on some farms of some cows, um, would or or would be likely to cause changes in the consistency of butter if if indeed there are any changes in the consistency of butter and again we we have a little bit of uh sort of passively acquired data uh that's been reported out of lactonet which is the uh the milk recording agency for uh for management purposes for dairy farmers in canada and and two snippets of information there help to uh, at least support that notion you know, sort of based on the available evidence. And one of those is that um, doing milk fatty acid profile monitoring, which which more and more of herds do just as part of fine tuning their nutrition, um, would indicate that there's really been no change in the fatty acid profile of milk over the last year, at least for the uh, many hundreds of samples taken in Quebec before this, this whole... Uh, controversy uh, came came to the fore. Um, so it's completely within normal limits. That's to say, for example, the amount of palmitic acid or the proportion of palmitic acid in milk, which as Mike said, is, is naturally occurring to a very large degree, that really hasn't changed out of any anything that would be expected. And again, some data that, that predates this whole question, but from 2018, from, from the same source, uh, when they looked specifically at the fatty acid profile of milk of herds that did or didn't use fat supplements in the in the herd's diet um, the herds that didn't the proportion of palmitic acid was 33 percent the herds that did it was 33.5 percent and there's really no reason to think that that difference that that very small difference would translate to changes in the consistency of of butter Okay, so so there's some 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 preliminary evidence. Again, it's it worth looking in, but there's some preliminary evidence that that th- th- there's not been a change in the fat. That there might be something else that's going on. Andrew, I heard you say earlier that there have been no changes in your use. If anything, last year you used less than the year before. Small sample. We need to watch that. But but. You know, we've had summers, which is one of the incentives that, you know, sometimes we have some short term incentives to increase production when demand is a little higher. And it's my understanding that 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 palm fats get used in those circumstances for short terms. But there's no indication that there was a change in the incentive structure within the marketing of uh, uh, or the, the 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 buying of milk from farmers. So so. Not clear that there's been any change in behavior on the farm. Some evidence that there's not been any change in the milk coming off of those farms. So there may be a pro- there may be a, a change in butter, but there's not any evidence that to suggest necessarily that this is the reason for it. Is that a reasonable conclusion for me to draw? Certainly from my perspective, Mike, that that is the kind of the question that I am left with as well, is that, you know, wow, there hasn't been a lot of great changes. I know one of the points that was made over the last, um, you know, couple of weeks was this conversation that, well, there is all this newfound demand for butter, therefore, you know, dairy farmers, you know, needed to meet that need. But 
that simply necessarily wasn't the case because we saw decreases in other areas um, of that dairy chain. So, you know, we weren't sending nearly as much 18% cream through Tim Hortons and Starbucks. So therefore, <laughs> because of that lower demand, you know, that, that butter fat got moved to another area. So certainly from our perspective in terms of, you know, how much we needed to produce compared to past years was actually, um, you know, quite similar and actually probably a decrease compared to what we may have seen, you know, five to seven years ago when you could open your curtains and show people that you were eating butter again, <laughs> um, you know, was, was that big thing. Um, and so when we do piece together what, you know, what has changed, I think that for me as the farmer is definitely one of the things that I really want to see is let's let's actually start researching this. If we haven't been looking at, you know, what the melting point is of butter, you know, l I hope somebody takes up that challenge and starts doing some tests on different brands, different regions, and then continues that. Because I think, you know, I sit back and I wonder, okay, if some are having, um, you know, a challenge with harder butter today, you know, great. Let's see if that is happening, where it's happening. Is it regional? Is it time of the year? And then let's track it for a number of years because has this happened? Did this happen five years ago? Did this happen 10 years ago? Um, you know, is it an on and off? Because that's really where I think we might be able to piece it together a little better is to get that starting point is to see what are we actually working with here. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And you made a point, seasonal, uh, regional company differences, all of those I think are, are, are worth, are worth looking at. Uh, I, I was talking to a baker over the weekend and, and she said, well, I have my favorite kind of butter. It's always been different. And, and it wasn't an organic or anything. It was a specific company that made it. And, and she was convinced that was the best. Again, I don't know that that's true or not, or that it's different. It's true in her mind. And so, so, I think, uh, again, without diminishing the, the perceptions that there are changes in butter, if we want to actually find out, A, if there are, and B, what's causing them, we need to be a little bit more systematic about that process. So the, the, last, the last question I had is going to take a step back from, from this discussion of butter and, and things and, and get to the question that I think has started to emerge to a degree with some people is, is palm oil, palm fats uh, have uh, a bad reputation. Uh, the, the, the use of them exploded in the early 2000s for a variety of reasons. Uh, and we saw massive deforestation in areas that produce palms as they were building these palm plantations. And people have raised concerns even before this, not, not specifically with respect to dairy, but uh, with respect to palm oil use because of those sustainability, the, the rainforest, the deforestation issues. The question becomes, should we be feeding palm fats to dairy cows? I'll leave it open to anyone who wants to jump in. <laughs> well, maybe I'll start then from the farmer perspective because I I, I don't know <laughs> if if it's a if it's a you know ball that nobody wants to play with. Uh, I will certainly pick it up first because you know I guess from my perspective is obviously I've I've heard and I've seen those concerns out there. Um, you know, and and one of the things that you know we. We maybe and maybe it was you know our our fault, but we we did graze over the fact that you know our provider is um, you know has committed in the past to no deforestation, no exploitation. Um, you know wants to you know from you know the perspective of you know their their brand be a sustainable source for palm. Now the questions I've gotten before you know kind of range from how honest is that sustainability pledge. And certainly, you know, in digging, you know, beyond it, you know, there's a round table for sustainable production, you know, with Palm, um, you know, I, some say it's good. Some say it's not strong enough. Um, I think there's a lot of questions and I think the industry is now going through to say, okay, let's dig a little deeper into what that certification means 
um, you know, to know, because, you know, certainly from our perspective in agriculture, you know, in the dairy industry, we have ProAction at a, as a certification program. We think it's quite strong. Um, you know, it's not me to criticize at this point the strength of their certification program without actually digging a little deeper. So I think that's probably as we figure out the melting point and hardness issue, I know full well from the conversations I've had with lots of other people in the industry at the same time, that conversation about, is this truly sustainable is also going to happen. Yep. Uh, Mike or Steven, anything to add there? Yeah, it's a very complex question and I, uh, have been debating it with myself for many years. Uh, I just want to mention some things is that we're not really driving the palm industry and the dairy industry. We're using the the waste products of it. Okay. So I, I think that we need to account for that when we look at the ethics behind feeding these products too. And where would these go? And we're, we're feeding a, you know, really inexpensive palm oil if it's two to four dollars per kilo so so where does that go if it doesn't uh make its way into animal feeds but i think that the bigger question and what i was a little bit disappointed with last week we were talking about butter hardness i think we should be talking about sustainability of the environment and you know uh purchasing ingredients locally i i would have preferred if the conversation was about that last week compared to um the hardness of butter yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and and i would just add that uh you know, like, like with anything, uh, I think we need to tr do our best to inform what might ultimately be values based judgments, but, but inform them as best we can with the available evidence. So like Andrew alluded to, um, not only that there is um, a, a certification scheme around sustainable palm, but try to dig into, well, you know, is that, is that meaningful? Is that successful? Is that adequate or, or not? And th those are really tough things for, for us as individual consumers to do that. That's for sure. Um, but at the same time, I, I think it's important to, you know, if, if one is going to take a stand to, to, to try to scratch into those things rather than, uh, kind of shooting from the hip because that, you know, sometimes that's where we get into the, the, the troubles of unintended consequences, you know, here, could we, could we provide the nutritional supports to our cows in other ways? Uh, probably so, but, but as Mike alluded to, you know, at the very least, we need to ask those questions about, uh, you know, not just this good, that bad, you know, ban this, ban that. And, and, you know, then it's sort of some kind of nirvana because, because there's always knock on effects and, and unattended consequences. So in this particular case, yeah, I, I guess I would just advocate for let, let's all, uh, try to gather as much information. And if we don't have enough information to, to really make an informed decision let's try to gather some more and at the end of the day sure you know we all have to make decisions as, as individuals or, or as farmers or nutritionists or or the the policy makers um, in the face of some uncertainty and and, and bringing values to bear but uh, uh, but let's let's just do that and then you know as, as thoughtful and considered a way as opposed to kind of a you know well I I, I thought about it for two seconds and uh, uh, as I, I, I think you referred to, uh, uh, Mike, uh, let's try to avoid the uh, ready, fire, aim approach to uh, <laughs> to this question and others. Yeah, and, and and I'm an economist. One of the things they talk about in economics all the time is trade offs, and and what's been absent from this discussion to a significant degree are is what are the benefits we're getting out of using these palm fats on the farm from a health perspective, from a energy balance perspective. And, and that's not to say that I want to diminish by any stretch the, the sustainability arguments, but I think that we, we often see us have a knee-jerk reaction to work, you know, fat's not always a good word, oil's not always a good word. And, and if people don't have an understanding of the certification programs like Andrew was talking about and, and some of, the, uh, and, and, and some of the, 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 the starting points for this product, we, we should have a reasoned and holistic discussion of this issue and then make an informed decision. And I, and I don't think any of the four of us would want it any different. Uh, as we wrap up, is there any point that that any of you would like to make that that I was remiss in not asking you, or is there, is there anything you'd like to add as we close, or a quick closing comment? 
Uh, I'd like to say that I think I've met a lot of farmers who are very aware of uh, some of the issues with feeding palm oil, and um, they're making very informed decisions. Some of them have, have invested a lot of time researching this on their own, and some have decided to continue to feed, and some have decided not to. And I just wanted to reiterate that, that I, I'm really impressed by the dairy farmers here in Canada that they're so aware of a lot of these issues and doing the due diligence of researching this by themselves uh, with their nutritionists or veterinarians. These are thoughtful, thoughtful, informed decisions. Yes. And that's certainly, you know, from the conversations that I've had with a few different nutritionists, not just my own, was that same point is that, you know, the nutritionists that I have spoken to said, you know, we see a flag here, uh -huh. um, you know, so, so it hasn't been our first choice every time to solve every problem. It's, you know, as Stephen said, it's kind of that tool in the toolkit that, okay, it's a good source from a nutritional standpoint, if we need it at a particular point, um, you know, but man, if we could find a different way to do that or try a few different things, maybe that's the right approach. And just lastly, you know, um, Mike mentioned it, you know, in terms of that byproduct. I think that fits into that conversation too, that if this is a choice of putting it in a cow or putting it in a landfill, um, you know, cows, I'm a big fan of cows. They're great upcyclers in all the waste, um, you know, in, in so many of these things. So is there an opportunity? I just... I'm really hoping we can have a more level-headed, calmer discussion, get into the gray zone rather than just make this black and white. Perfect. Stephen, any closing comments? Yeah, just just to reiterate that is that, uh, you know, it, it can be um, frustrating at times to sort of have to wait for some some evidence to come in. But, I, you know, I think the, 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 the real value of uh, asking some of these questions in – a variety of forums from social media to consumers who really care about their butter to the farmers, nutritionists, you know, uh, just uh, piping up with their observations and their voice. I think that's really valuable. Um, but, but that, that should, should and does stimulate us to go gather some data and, and actually, you know, take our best shot at, at answering things from an informed perspective as opposed to uh, just sort of a, a stampede to, to do this or stop that and, and, and have this all, uh, you know, somehow in air quotes decided by lunchtime, um, yeah. but, you know, we can do better. Good. Thank you, gentlemen. I, I learned a lot. Uh, I think those who listen will learn something too. And uh, I appreciated the balance uh, and informed discussion. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mike.